Before we get started, I would like to recognize some special guests that we have with us this evening. First, the co-author of Senate Bill 944, which recognizes February 6th each year as Ronald Reagan Day, Senator Dennis Hollingsworth and his wife, Natalie. <laughs> Thousand Oaks City Council member, Tom Glancy. Agora Hill City Council member Dennis Weber. And someone hiding out there, the person who helps keep this place running, my boss, Executive Director John Highbush. I think it's safe to assume that everyone in this audience enjoys a good book. I know I do. And people choose books for all sorts of reasons. Some people choose books because they enjoy the author or the main character. Some people choose books because they were recommended by a friend or even because they like the book jacket in the corner store, if there even are corner stores anymore. And some people even choose books because of the book's status on the New York Times bestseller list. Well, a few months ago, I picked up a book in this latter category. When I told a few friends what I was reading, they all, and this was at separate times, mind you, said that although they thoroughly enjoyed the book, it took them about 100 pages to get into it. Stick with it, they said. You'll love the rest of the book. So needless to say, I trudged through the book. It took me two months to get through the first 100 pages. <laughs> but I stuck with it. They were right. And when I finally got through it, I couldn't put it down. Now, then there's Vince Flynn's books. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Within page one, excuse me, paragraph one, you're hooked. I opened American Assassin on its release date last week and read 128 pages in my first sitting because I didn't want to put it down. I only stopped because my daughters were complaining I wouldn't help them with their homework. I tried to politely explain the book was my homework, but you and I know that was just a little white lie so I could read at home. But isn't that the way reading should be? Hooked from the beginning? When Mitch Rapp is the main character, that's definitely how it is. Great character, great author, New York Times bestseller, great book jacket. What more can you ask for? Now I have to say this is a first <laughs> I have to say this is a first for us. Yes, we hold book signings and lectures all the time. Just this past year we've had Laura Bush. Mitt Romney, Sean Hannity, just to name a few. In fact, yesterday we had Condoleezza Rice. But Vince Flynn is the first author we've hosted who didn't work for Ronald Reagan or who's not in the political or military arena. But wait, isn't he at least sort of? <laughs> Read by current and former presidents, foreign heads of state, and intelligence professionals around the world, Vince's novels are taken so seriously that one high-ranking CIA official told his people I want you to read Flynn's books and start thinking about how we can more effectively wage this war on terror. <laughs> and after reading a few of Vince's books, I can easily draw correlations between Ronald Reagan, Vince Flynn, and yes, even Mitch Rapp. Yes. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was a true patriot. He loved America and what it stood for, freedom and democracy. Ronald Reagan was determined to bring an end to the Cold War and to communism, and he didn't back down until the sorry didn't back down until he accomplished his mission. And couldn't we say the same for Mitch Rapp? Now, Mr. Rapp's determination is a bit different than our nation's 40th presidents. If I recall an American assassin, Mitch's determination is noted not for revenge but for retaliation. But he was determined nonetheless, determined to protect America from the terrorists who want to take away its freedom. And what about Mr. Flynn? Well, determined is the perfect word to describe him. Wanting to write a book, he did not let his childhood diagnosis of dyslexia deter him, even though he struggled with reading and writing his whole life. And when he received not one, not two, not three, but 60 rejection letters, he didn't stop, that, that didn't stop him either. He just went ahead and self-published his first book, Term Limits, in Minnesota. 
The book went to number one in the Twin Cities, and within a week, he had a new agent and a two-book deal with Pocket Books, a Simon & Schuster imprint. <laughs> and thanks to Vince's determination, we now have a gripping, edge of your seat, can't put it down, leave me wanting more series of books with an amazing main character. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Vince Flynn. Thank you. Am I okay to round or do I talk to you? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Melissa, thank you for that great introduction. I, uh, I've had a lot of introductions, and uh, very rarely am I left nervous in my seat. Where is, where is this person going with this? <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, which book took her 100 pages to get into? <laughs> wow, what? I, I mean, I can't remember. I don't think I've ever written a book that was that slow. Um, to you people up there drinking beer, I'm very jealous. Uh, I am an Irish kid from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, this is a huge honor. I have, um, there's been a lot of things in my life that I've predicted or hoped for. Um, I often laugh. Um, I'm usually in the Bay Area when this happens. Somebody uh, introduces me and says, the thing we love about Vince is he's doing this for his passion for writing. He's not in it to make money. <laughs> and I kind of look around. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you didn't read the part about my bio that says I'm a red-blooded capitalist. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, or my, my favorite is they'll say, you know, when Vince Flynn started writing, he, uh, he never ever in a million years dreamed that he would become a n number one New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, pre <laughs> I pretty much went to bed every night for about five years dreaming that exact thing um, <laughs> that I, I hoped. I mean, I didn't take it for granted. You, you can't do that in this world. Um, I liken it to the Oscars every year when a woman gets up to receive the, uh, the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. And she stands there and she says, you know, with tears in her eyes, I, I've never ever in a million years imagined that this night would happen. <laughs> and I roll my eyes and go, mm-hmm. She's been dreaming about this since she was eight years old. <laughs> it is the only thing she's ever thought of. Um, so for me, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I, I always wanted to be a number one New York Times bestseller, uh, and I've accomplished that, and it feels great. But there's a lot of things in my life that along that journey I didn't predict, couldn't have predicted. One of them is this evening right here. I am a Ronald Reagan kid. Um, my best friend from high school flew in from St. Paul. Tom, stand up. <laughs> Tom likes to tell people that Mitch Rapp was fashioned after him. And uh, I let him go with that until he got married. And then I said, we can put an end to that. You're not going to pick up any more women in the bars. It doesn't work. Um, but we entered St. Thomas uh, Academy, which is an all-male Catholic military high school in Mendota Heights, a suburb of St. Paul, back in the fall of 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected President of the United States, 40th President of the United States. Ronald Reagan, more than any other president, defined, I don't know if I can speak for both of us, but he, I think he defined how I grew up. Because I, I really think in high school and college, it's when you really start to kind of get a grasp on what's going on in the world. And what a great president to grow up with. I mean this, you know, from everything about him, his love for his wife, his passion for this country, the way he stood up to communism in a way that no president had stood up to communism. And he listened to the hue and cry from the left on Capitol Hill, and he smiled and took it, and he stayed the course, and he pushed them over the brink. And it's, it's the guy probably more than any president other than you know, you've got to put Washington up there, absolutely, and Lincoln and some others that were great. But of the modern era, in my mind, it is, not a, it is no contest at all. He was the greatest. Um, people ask me, why this genre? Why do I write about terrorism? Again, go back to the 80s. So spring of my freshman year in high school, 
what happens? In March, President Reagan gets shot, almost killed. In May, Pope John Paul gets shot, almost dies. We felt like the world was coming apart. We'd already been through the, we'd just gotten out of the Iranian hostage scenario, uh, and then we went into the embassy bombing in Beirut and the Marine barracks bombing in Beirut. And then as we move through the 80s, we've got the problem with Libya and the discotheque bombing in Berlin and the Achille Loro. And, um, and, and then the, the one that really hit me the hardest was uh, the Pan Am Lockerbie. And as I saw communism doing this, I saw Islamic radical fundamentalism and terrorism doing that. And I thought, this is the next big front. Um, Daniel Silva is a good friend of mine and one of my favorite authors, and we often talk about how people will interview us and they'll say, how did you guys figure it out? How were you writing about this threat before 9-11? And I always just, we, we both give the same response, which is, you know when the guy took out the AK-47 and fired it into the air and said death to America and he burned the flag? We took him at his word that he actually meant it. And uh, we thought, you know, if we don't go deal with these guys, it, it might really come back and bite us pretty hard. And unfortunately, it did. And, uh, and today, I, I still worry a lot about the, the partisan squabbling over how we wage this war. I, I tell you, I'm going to try to be very deferential and respectful. I feel like I'm, I'm in church right now at this museum. Um, <laughs> maybe if, if the uh, director gives me the nod at one point, maybe I'll cut loose a little bit. But I... Um, I will often, <laughs> I, I will often get going on. Um, you're not going to hear me talk about healthcare tonight, okay? <laughs> you're not going to hear me talk about uh, stimulus, any of that stuff. Although I do think that the the national debt does fall into the sphere of national security when it gets this big, and we have to rein it in. So I, I tend to um, really keep my the things that I discuss involving national security, Islamic radical fundamentalism, terrorism, the threats, where it's headed, writing, the fun stuff, and the, and the nasty stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to delve off into partisan politics, but with one exception. And um, it really came through in extreme measures in pursuit of honor for me. I'll talk a little bit about American Assassin later. You know, this is the book I've wanted to write for 15 years. And for any of you who haven't read the series, it's the perfect place to start. But something happened inside me with extreme measures in pursuit of honor. And I already felt very passionate about my, what I saw as the rising wave of fanaticism within Islam. And it comes out even in the earliest books. Uh, term limits didn't deal with it, but transfer of power did, the third option did. Um, they all pretty much have. And it's, it really is my great fear. But then when I get to extreme measures, it, the book was inspired by a friend of mine who, after 9-11, first of all, he fought in the first Gulf War, served in the Marine Corps, took a leave of absence from the CIA to go do that. And then um, after that war, went back to work for the CIA, and he bopped around the Middle East. He was station chief in Yemen, Amman, Jordan, Moscow. He was everywhere. And when... Um, 9-11 happened, he was the uh, deputy director for the Near East, which is, that's the hot spot. He basically got on a plane after 9-11 and saw his family on average 30 to 60 days a year for the next five years and did everything that you could imagine for this country. Uh, this man's name is Rob Richard. He eventually was promoted to the uh, deputy associate director of the clandestine service, which is the number two guy at Langley who runs their spies. He and his wife right now are riding across America. I saw him in Phoenix on Sunday on a bicycle. Well, two bicycles, actually. Um, <laughs> but I, I really, I want you, especially people who are watching online, please go to peddlingforpatriots.com. You can go to my website, vinceflynn.com, and be linked to their website. They're, they're riding across the country to raise money for uh, college tuition for the CIA officers who've been killed abroad. Uh, right now, there's a little loophole in our government. Uh, CIA officers who are killed overseas are not, uh, they're not, uh, they can't apply for the GI Bill, their kids can't. So they're really kind of left on their own. And as we all know, in Coast, we suffered a huge loss this past year. And Rob and Kim are, are riding to raise the money 
for those kids to go to college. So please go to my website, link to uh, pedalingforpatriots.com and try to contribute. And the reason why I bring this story up about Rob is because we were doing, we were gaming out some scenarios one time and I said, Rob, what's your biggest fear? Now, I live in a suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota. So I'm always fascinated by people who live within the Beltway. And my, I was trying to predict his answer and I thought for sure he was gonna say to me, my biggest fear is that a nuke is gonna go off in Washington and kill my family. His answer surprised me. It was, my biggest fear is that I'm gonna come back from overseas doing exactly what my government asked me to do and I'm gonna land at a certain non-disclosed airstrip in Washington, D.C. And there's going to be some government sedans waiting for me. And I'm going to be arrested by the FBI and the Justice Department. And my whole life is going to get turned upside down. And if you want to know that, if you've read those books, now you understand my motivation about how much that sickened me. I am known for my contacts in Washington. And I have never been more hot than what I saw happen in those years when Speaker Pelosi and, and uh, Harry Reid and a lot of other people got up and said um, that they had no idea that KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, was being waterboarded, that they had no idea that any of this stuff was going on. I liken it to the great scene in Casablanca where the pub owner is out. I'm shocked that there's gambling in this establishment. <laughs> you know, how, 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 uh, how could this happen? Um, and here's the sad thing. These men and women at the CIA, they're handcuffed. They are bound by an oath that they can't run to the press and jump in front of a microphone and say, hey, by the way, I briefed Speaker Pelosi personally about every single thing we did to KSM and the other high value targets. And so that's when I got, I would say my books just took on a more decided political bent. I was really upset about how that went down. And as an aside, I, I get very frustrated by the debate on torture. I like to call it enhanced interrogation, but you can call it torture if you want. <laughs> enhanced interrogation, extreme measures, torture is never something that a civilized society should do wantonly. It shouldn't happen. We, but to back up on it, our, our enemy is unlike anything we've ever seen. They don't put on a uniform. I love this. Are there any contract attorneys in the audience tonight? <laughs> I'm not going to slam you. Raise your hand. This is important. Here's the deal. If only one party signs a contract, is that party bound to honor that contract if the other party does not sign the contract? Absolutely not. Why do we keep talking about the Geneva Convention when Al-Qaeda and a lot of these other thugs have never signed that document. In fact, they target women and children. <laughs> they do not put on a uniform, which is a, which is a very crucial component to the Geneva Convention, Convention. In fact, guess what happens to you if you are a United States uh, service member and you are caught in a war zone without your uniform on? You are treated as a spy and you are no longer afforded the rights of the Geneva Convention. And we have allowed the hyper left in this country, the ACLU, and a lot of other people to take control of this debate over enhanced interrogations. I can tell you emphatically, enhanced interrogation, enhanced measures works. All right? Is it possible, a la Saddam Hussein, to bring a man into a room and have a bunch of thugs beat him up, threaten to rape his daughter, and get him to sign a false confession. Absolutely. That is not the way these were handled. The men who did the waterboarding, by the way, were all waterboarded themselves. Every person who participated in that program had to first be waterboarded so they would understand what it was like. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed did not speak for almost a month, refused to answer a single question that we gave to him. Once we began waterboarding him, he tried to lie. Do you know how we knew he was lying? The first 20 questions that we asked him, we knew the answers to. Like any good trial attorney, you don't put somebody up on the witness stand and ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. So they peeled back the layer on KSM and ended up rolling up foreign bank accounts where money was being hidden, uh, terrorist cells, 
all kinds of different things. It was a virtual tre treasure trove. And if you talk to the men and women at the White House at that time and at the CIA, the DOD, they will all tell you that those interrogations saved lives and prevented future terrorist attacks. Now, this is something that I really, there's a change going on in America right now. And a lot of it has to do with our financial situation and it's about time and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for it. I like to joke that uh, one of my favorite spectacles in the last few years has, has uh, been to see senators stand up and act shocked that Bernie Madoff supposedly ran the largest Ponzi scheme in the history of uh, <laughs> modern civilization. And I think, no, isn't that what you've been doing with Social Security and the lockbox for uh, 30 years? Um, but please, let's not forget the snake eaters in this next year. Let's not forget the men and women of the CIA. And we need to be more vocal about this. And I am so earnest on this measure. We are so close to a Mumbai attack in this country. It scares the death out of me. I worry about it every day. They learn from Mumbai. They learn from Fort Hood. Bullets and fire is what is easy. Making an, imp an improvised explosive device is very difficult, as the uh, Christmas Day underwear bomber proved, and everybody and, and all the other people who've tried it. It's not as easy to do. And so we need to be more aggressive and outspoken about this and stand up for those people who are on the front line. And I think that's what these books do, more so than any other thing. I get a lot of outreach from those people when I'm in DC thanking me for putting their story forward because they are bound by their oath. They can't stand up and defend themselves, so they need more of us to do it. And, and I'm very serious about this. All of you can participate. You can put pressure on your politicians, you can blog about it, you can write about it, you can talk about it, and you can help people get their mind around this complex issue, because what my fear is, if we don't get better about confronting this, we are gonna get hit again, then it's gonna get really nasty. At that point, you will see people start to, you know, torch mosques and things like that, and that's not where we wanna go. We don't wanna do that, but we have to confront this thing. Um, a couple of quick stories to get onto a lighter subject. I, uh, in addition to never thinking in a million years I'd be invited to the Reagan Library to speak, um, I never thought that some other things would happen in my life. And um, one of my favorite stories is when I uh, returned from a vacation with my wife and there was a note from the White House on our kitchen counter. Um, and it said, uh, Dear Vince, I read Consent to Kill over the holidays. Love the book, keep up the good work. Um, I have several friends in the printing business who are extremely wealthy. And um, this had White, Heart, White House stationery and a postmark from Washington, D.C. And I, I thought, you know, this could be the president or it could be somebody pulling a, a, a joke on me. So a couple weeks later, I was on Governor Tim Pawlenty's radio show. I mentioned that I had received the letter, and he said, well, let me, let me call the White House and see what I can find out. And he, he called me back a couple days later and said, um, it's true. He's a fan of the books, and uh, they want to know if you want to meet Air Force One when it lands. I said, absolutely, that'd be great. So I go out to the airport. I'm fascinated because all I do is study the Secret Service, and, you know, I'm watching them how they're checking me, and I'm like, oh, you didn't check back there, and you should, you know, what's going on? <laughs> I'm looking at the snipers, and oh, there's one, there's another sniper, you know. I'm looking at everything but what everybody else is looking at. And uh, I love whenever I, uh, whenever I run into the Secret Service agents around the president, because they always give me a little nod, I love the books, nice work. Um, so we, uh, we're out there on the tarmac, and Air Force One lands, and I, just being in front of that plane, the plane here is really cool, that thing is so big, it wheels up and you're just, you feel like a kid. It's Christmas Day, here comes Air Force One. There's a big red, red carpet. I'm at the end of the line, it's Governor Plenty, the base commander, a bunch of other people. And I'm just standing there and here's the limo and I'm thinking, uh, this is no big deal, all right? Uh, they meet thousands of people every week or every month. They're just gonna shake my hand, I'll smile, they'll get in the car, they'll be gone, no problem. Out comes the first lady, she comes down and uh, I stick out my hand, I said, Mrs. Bush, it's a real honor to meet you. My name is Vince Flynn. Um, 
And she says, I know who you are, Vince. You're my husband's favorite author. He can't wait to meet you. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, and I'm enough of a smart aleck that I'm kind of thinking in the back of my head, you know, I heard he didn't read books. And so <laughs> am, I, am I his only author? Or, or this could be a small competition, me and one other guy. Um, <laughs> But uh, I've since found out then, and, and Carl Rove is great to talk about this, he's an avid, avid reader. They got in a competition, I think it was his last year in office, and I, I want to say the number was 78 novels the president read. Books, history, he mixed it up, he reads everything. He's a voracious reader. Now, you know, he doesn't drink anymore, and that's why, I, if I didn't drink, I'd read more too, probably. <laughs> um, but, so now he comes up, and I'm, all of a sudden a little anxious, you know, but I shake his hand and he is so affable. You know, he's so nice. Um, he's the kind of guy that, you know, you, you got to understand if you're going to run for that office, uh, I don't care about your politics for this point, point of this discussion. You can't go raise that kind of money and not be a people person. So he comes up and he's so much better in person, although he will, I've spent a fair amount of time with him since then and he will get the old he, he gets that deal going sometimes, you know, and you're like, is it Will Ferrell or the president? Um, but uh, he, uh, you know, we shake hands and he's, we're talking and all of a sudden he points at the limousine and he says, would you, take a, would you like to take a ride in the limo with the first lady and I? And uh, I'm like, uh, you know, sure, what, am I, you know, what are you going to say? <laughs> no, actually, sir, my car's here and uh, I don't know where we're going, so... Um, I jump in the back of the limo and I'm facing the trunk and it's Governor Plenty, Mary Plenty, the First Lady, the President, and we are barely off the airport grounds when he, the President, looks to Governor Plenty and says, hey, Gov, you read this guy's books? And uh, Governor Plenty says, yes, I do. I've read them all, Mr. President. They're fantastic. And the President um, kind of looks over at me and says, they're a little too accurate, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, and again, Again, I'm thinking Will Ferrell. You know, it's one of those deals. I'm like, and then without giving me a chance to think, he says, where do you get your information? <laughs> and I, I was sweating bullets. I mean, <laughs> sweating bullets. I started to stutter and stammer. Uh, I felt like I was in the principal's office in fifth grade. <laughs> um, and the first lady saved me. She kind of whacked him on the arm and said, oh, George, leave him alone. And, uh, and then he said, oh, well, it's okay. We think we, you got these two guys out of Langley and we know of another guy at the Pentagon. He's kind of going on and on. I mean. <laughs> and, uh, and so we get out to 3M, uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. And we pull under this big tent for security and we get out and I'm saying goodbye to the First Lady. And then um, uh, all of a sudden I hear my name. He always calls me Vincent for some reason. And he pushes his way through the crowd, the Secret Service agents, and he says, the next time you're in Washington, give me a call, I'd love to hang out. <laughs> and I'm like, I absolutely think this is a Texas thing. I'm on, this is just, it's a y'all or whatever. And, um, and so he, uh, he leaves and I don't have a ride back to the airport. Um, <laughs> so his assistant handed me a business card and uh, I called and I went uh, back to the White House on several occasions. Uh, spent an unbelievable uh, several meetings, but one in particular uh, in the Oval Office with him in those two chairs in front of the fireplace with Dan Bartlett, um, was there for the first half of the meeting and then Dan left and it was just he and I and what a trip. I've got a photo that I cherish of, of the President and I walking down that colonnade from on a different trip uh, from the Oval Office back over to the residence. And I, you know, you look at it and you think of those great photos of Ronald Reagan and Nancy walking down the colony and you're just like, the people who have made that trip before, it was such an honor. Uh, and he really is a very interesting guy. And in person, I was floored by how good he was, his mastery of what was going on. Um, the meeting, one meeting in particular I had with him was entirely off the record. I haven't even told my wife what we talked about. But he was uh, looking to hear some opinions from people outside the Beltway. Uh, and I think every president has pretty much done that because they eventually feel so closed in. 
and we had a very earnest discussion about where this was all going. And I was really impressed with how solid he was, how passionate he was about uh, making sure we didn't get hit again, that we were his family, and that feeling that he had on 9-11 when those towers went down, and he felt like somebody had broken into his house and killed somebody in his family, and the, how he did not sleep for weeks, for months, worrying that the next attack was coming, and he had to do everything he could to make us safe. And um, for that, I will always applaud that man. You can say what you want about some other things in his administration and quibble about some of his, you know, his educational bill with Ted Kennedy or something like that, but here was a guy who did his best to keep us safe, and he did, by the way. Uh, we didn't get hit again. One other, one other quick story uh, for, are there any secret Democrats in the audience tonight? <laughs> You're up there drinking, aren't you? Um, I'm kidding. Uh, my wife and I were in New York City about, uh, it's probably three, four years ago, which, and by the way, I have to laugh, Melissa, in the introduction, you said um, uh, he's read by current and former presidents. I think that introduction is slightly outdated. Um, <laughs> You might want to change the current part. Just, yeah. You might want to change the current part. So um, uh, we're walking down the street in New York. It's, it's UN Head of Nation uh, Week, Summit. And uh, if you've ever been in New York during that week, it's insane. There, there's 20 cops on every street corner in Midtown, and traffic is horrible. And we were going to get a phone charger for my wife. And... I'd finished meetings at Simon & Schuster all day, and we changed into shorts and T-shirts to go just walk around the city before dinner. And uh, up ahead, I see a bunch of cops, tall Secret Service-looking guys, and then the shock of white hair. And I said, honey, I think that's President Clinton. And she said, my God, I think you're right. And I said, let's go say hello. And, uh, <laughs> and she's like, and she's a very shy Scandinavian gal. Um, she looks a little bit like the former Mrs. Woods a little bit, actually. Um, <laughs> And uh, which figures into a later part of the story. Um, <laughs> so we're walking, walking along, and I, I, I take my, uh, we have some secret service here, people here, by the way. I take my sunglasses off because two things I knew about President, one thing I knew about President Clinton, one thing about the Secret Service. Secret Service, they want to see your eyes. They really want to get a look at your eyes and size you up. The second thing is President Clinton was a guy who liked to press the flesh um, and meet people and shake, <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 help me, I meant it, am I right, in a polit, that's what you politicians do, right, you shake hands, you press the, press the flesh, so I, uh, I walk past the first agent, I say hello, and then the next one, hello, and we look harmless enough, you know, and the third one, he kind of give me the look, and then one of uh, President Clinton's staffers jumps out with his briefcase and says, excuse me, you're going to have to walk around the street or walk, walk across the street. And I don't know how, what, it, what came over me, but I looked at the guy and I said, that's okay, we're just gonna say hello quick, we have some mutual friends. And I walked around the guy, <laughs> which, and, and this, is, this is true, by the way, it's part of the story. This is why I was actually saying hello, because uh, a certain person told me that he was a fan of the books. So I, I uh, step around this guy, President Clinton shakes the last police officer's hand, and he looks at me with those doughy eyes, and, uh, and, I'm, and he shakes my hand. Now, no calluses. I mean, this hand, this is the hand of an attorney. I mean, it is, it is supple, and you're like, oh, God, this guy, you know. I'm reaching for my wallet. I'm ready to hand it over. Um, he, uh, I said, Mr. President, it's a real honor to meet you. We have some mutual friends, James Carville and Mary Matlin. That's, the, that's where this comes in. And uh, I said, uh, my name's Vince Flynn. And he looks at me and he says, I know exactly who you are. I have read every single one of your books. And he starts yelling at the Secret Service agents, guys, it's Vince Flynn. <laughs> and, he, and they're looking around, they're smiling, and he's going, we read your books. I buy them. I'm an author. I buy them. And then I pass them around to the guys. We sit up late at night and talk about who should play Mitch Rapp in the movies. You know, he's going on and on. Um, so we're standing there shooting the breeze, and uh, I introduce him to my wife, and, uh, and then he pulls me in close, and he says, you know, oh, your wife's hot. And, uh, 
<laughs> he, he didn't say it, all right? But I tell you, how much you want to bet he was thinking it? How much you want to bet, huh? <laughs> yeah, he was. Um, and so we, we, we stand there and shoot the breeze for four or five minutes. And I, I'm not kidding. This guy, I've never quite been around somebody this smooth, this good of a politician. And uh, we're getting ready to leave. And I, I said, Mr. President, it's a great meeting. I don't want to take up your time. I'm sure you're busy. And he, he looks at me and he says, I, I can't believe I'm meeting you right now. <laughs> and I, I stepped back and I, like, I was like, oh. I stepped back I said, you are good. I said, I never, I didn't vote for you. But if you were running again, I'd think about it. You're, you're that good. Um, I was blown away. So these books do reach across the aisle. And by the way, uh, you know, say what you want about President Clinton. Um, I, I, I really do believe he does not, uh, he, he wants our national security. He wanted, our, he wanted us to be secure. He might go about it a way that we disagree with. But uh, I don't think any of these guys that get elected to that office um, wantonly uh, want our men and women in harm's way to, 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 not, to not come back. So uh, that is one thing I hope we could unify a little bit on, but still argue the points. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A for a little bit. I think we've got about 20 minutes or so. Um, and if you are loud enough like I am, I will repeat the question. There are also going to be some mics floating around. Does anybody, uh, first question? Hold on one second. OK, so this is a night of firsts. Oh. So we're going to have another first for us tonight. We're going to take our first question from the YouTube audience, so we're going to direct our attention to the screen. I wanted to ask you about the process of writing. Do you create an outline of your story with all the plot twists and turns first before you actually start writing? Or do you just have a general idea for the story and you develop those plot twists and turns as you go? And do you sometimes surprise yourself? Thanks. I love your books. I'll try to repeat that. Um, basically, do I outline my books and do I ever surprise myself? I used to outline the entire novel, and what I found out uh, along the way is it never worked. I would spend months outlining the book, and then I would start to actually write the story, um, and the characters would take on a life of their own, and I would head off in a different direction. Uh, everybody, especially at this event, probably is familiar with the phrase that um, no good battle plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Um, you have to be fluid. You have to move. You have to adapt. And the same is for these, you know, these football coaches. Uh, they go into the game, and uh, they have a great game plan. And after the first series, they go, well, that's not going to work. Um, <laughs> let's try something different. So I, I outline basically the first 100 pages. And what I do is I have a kind of a box that I keep index cards in. And I, they're color coded. Blue is the good guy, red's the bad guy, uh, white I'm not sure about. And I write down these ideas as quick as they come to me. I throw them in the box, I throw them in the box, I throw them in the box. And every couple weeks, I go through those, and the good ideas float to the surface, and the bad ones get ripped and thrown in the garbage. And that's pretty much how I work. Now, there's, there's been a great benefit of writing like that, and it's this. Um, if I don't know what's going to happen next, there's no way you guys can predict where this is going, <laughs> right? And uh, what ends up happening, I write almost like I read, in the sense that I write at least half of this book the last two months. I work seven days a week, 12 hours Monday through Friday, uh, four to eight hours on the weekends, sometimes 15 hours. I, I, I go to a cabin in Wisconsin to get most of the writing done, and uh, I it is actually a great luxury. I've grown to love that I am up there in solitude. It's, I miss my family, and they come up on Thursday nights, and then they go back home on Monday and come up again. So I see them quite a bit. But when I'm up there alone, basically Monday through Thursday afternoon, I'm up at 7. I go dive in the lake no matter how cold it is. I go up to the office, and I start writing. And I don't take any breaks, really, other than to have some lunch and, you know, the eight cups of coffee I'm drinking and going to the bathroom and I'm just pecking away like a, like a hamster on a habit trail, you know, for that next uh, drink of water. And, um, and I, the pr I put myself in that pressure cooker. And then at, the, at about 7 o'clock at night, I will go downstairs uh, from my loft. I'll turn the grill on. I'll pour myself a drink. Yes, it has vodka in it. 
And then I, uh, I throw a steak on the grill, maybe some uh, baked potato. And then I go out on the lake in my pontoon boat. I park it in the middle of the lake. I pull out a notebook. And I light a cigar, and I say, all right, what's going to happen tomorrow? And I start to outline the scenes for the next day. And it is it's the, my favorite part of writing. It's almost like reading. It's that enjoyable that I get to sit there and just find out what's going to happen next. And actually, that was why this book was so much fun. I have wanted to write American Assassin, as I said, for 15 years. I wanted to really know more about Mitch Rapp. And so I got to go back and find out all these great things about him. And I'll give you an example. In this book, there's a character, Stan Hurley, who maybe is the best character I've ever created. Um, when I sat down to write it, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know he was going to become that good. I joked with Don Imus a week ago that I, I ch kind of channeled Don Imus, at least in the dialogue of that character. He's very caustic, and he tells people exactly what he thinks. And uh, so it was very interesting. How about a question from the audience? We're going to ask that you wait for someone to bring a microphone to you so the cameras can pick it up. Why don't you yell from up there? I'll repeat it. I pass. Um, <laughs> No, uh, here's what I'll say about that, because this, this is absolutely in the national security sphere. Uh, the question was, do I think it's a good idea that our current president wants to negotiate with the president of Iran? I find it interesting that he's going to try. Um, and uh, here's what I'm going to say about that, and I'll leave it alone. I was, the thing that disappointed me most about the last election wasn't necessarily the outcome. It was that I was alarmed to find or to see how many of my fellow citizens buy into the thought process if we just simply substituted a Republican in the Oval Office with a Democrat in the Oval Office, all of our problems would vanish and Iran would love us and uh, Hugo Chavez would treat us with respect and we'd all just get along. And that is a very dangerous, naive way to look at uh, foreign affairs. Um, and that's... And I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this about Ahmadinejad, because this, this gets my goat. I, I have been feeling more and more lately that this is similar to 1936 in Europe, that we've got Neville Chamberlain running around screaming, peace in our time, peace in our time, no matter what it takes, and Adolf is you know, spouting off about X, Y, and Z, and they're all saying, he doesn't mean it. Uh, you know. And now with um, Ahmadinejad, you know, I think uh, you know, Israel should be wiped off the face of the map. And you hear the pundits on CNN say, well, he's just trying to, he's just playing to his base. And I'm like, well, what does that say about his base? If, 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 we, if his base is a bunch of people who think that, we, that Israel should be annihilated and wiped off the faces of the map, shouldn't we start to talk about this and, 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 and be pretty frightened that that's what's going on? Um, so. And again, on the national security front, the UN drives me insane. I, I, I lose my mind over this. We, we have a debate in this country about this mosque on Ground Zero, and I, I'm very interested in it because it it's the First Amendment clashing within the First Amendment. You have free speech, which, which is the very first part of the First Amendment, and then the very next uh, part of it is freedom of religion. And so right now, all, you know, they have a right to build the mosque, and everybody else has a right to complain about them building the mosque. And so it's neither one... I, I'm a, I'm a strict constructionist. I believe in that, and you have the right to go against it. They have the right to build it. But the issue with the UN and the mosque is simply this. It's going to sound like a weird comparison at first, but the imam says, if we don't build this mosque now, there could be violence. <laughs> so I'm like, whoa, whoa. Uh, and then we got, a couple weeks later, Ahmadinejad comes to New York City, stands in the United Nations, and says... 9-11 was an inside job by the United States. Where is the outrage? The media barely gave it a knowing, you know, they just, and it just frustrates me to no end that that guy gets away with what he gets away with. I think we should, I would love it if our next cost-saving measure, because we give the UN billions of dollars every year, 
would be the next time Ahmadinejad says that, stand up and say, uh, the next president of the United States jumps up and says, I'm glad to hear you say that because we recommend that the, UN, that the UN vacate New York City and move to Tehran. And you can fund it. Have a nice life. We have someone with a microphone right over here. Question, whoever has a mic. I was just wondering, uh, how close are some of your characters in the book to people in real life? I'm, I'm specifically thinking of uh, Senator Lonsdale. She reminds me a lot of a senator from California. Yes. So. yes. Um, I could not help myself. Um, <laughs> When I was writing that, and I'll tell you, professionally, I'm a little, I'm, it's not my proudest moment. I, it's, that, was, that was throwing red meat to the wolves on that one. I mean, that was, there's, there's probably some similarities there. Yes. Next question. Um, you know, when I look at the cover of, the, of your books, I, I, I guess I envision you, or Mitch Rapp, looking exactly like you do. It's not that pretty with my shirt off, trust me. Well, I'm, but, I'm 44 now, it's kind of all going south. Anyway, I was curious, when you write, do you, uh, how many of the skills that Mitch has have you attempted or tried or, or, or mastered? I, I would never answer that question. <laughs> There's a few that I have tried. Um, I really can't go down this road now that I've, I'm thinking about it more and more. Um, the statute of limitations has not run out on, on some of the things I've tried. Um, uh, what, the only thing I'll tell you about who I see as Mitch Trap, and this will probably come up in a question here in a couple of minutes, but when I went and saw Black Hawk Down, Eric Bana walked on the screen and I went, Wow, that's the guy who's been in my head since 1995. He's a guy who I think looks the most like Mitch Rapp. There's other people who could pull it off, but I think he looks the most. Uh, There's a question right over there. Are we using the mic or yeah, no? Right. Well, I don't know. Uh, go, I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Uh, I had a question about um, okay. um, uh, the intelligence and how Mitch Rapp gathers his intelligence. Um, I know that satellites um, aren't the fastest way to get technology, and I know that uh, UAVs are a big thing now with the military, and I was wondering if um, it was a possibility that Mintrap would go that way or that he would stick with his old, old way of finding I, intelligence. I am constantly fascinated by the intelligence, and, and just so you understand, satellites are still in many ways every bit as good and in many ways better than the UAVs. The UAVs are catching up. They can do a lot of different things. With the, it's a tasking issue. Satellites are very expensive to reorbit, and so they tend to stay focused on certain areas, either in geosynchronous orbit or we have to wait for them to come around. Uh, I think it's twice a day. Anybody in aerospace here? Once. It's only once? Okay. What if it's going the opposite way really fast? <laughs> Wouldn't it be twice a day? I'm pretty sure on that one, by the way. If the planet's spinning this way and the satellite's going the other way, I think it's twice a day. Right? <laughs> Math was never my strong suit. So, <laughs> yeah, they absolutely can. But it, uh, the, the fuel is limited, so it's extremely expensive to retask them. So, what has happened is you have all the UAVs, the Predator is the most famous. Uh, you've got Global Hawk down the road in San Diego that is being made that's really going to blow everybody's doors off. Um, you can put multiple ones up for a fraction of the cost that it takes to put a satellite into orbit and keep it in orbit. Okay, we have right here in the front row. Sir. There's a new national security advisor that took over today named Donlan. Do you have any opinion of him? I don't. I'm sorry. I am in that uh, strange point in my life where uh, for it's all about touring, and I, I'm lucky to get a phone call into the home every day and see how my wife and the kids are doing. So um, I'll have to see if it's on the Drudge Report tomorrow and, and make some phone calls. We have another one right here. Yes. Have you ever refrained from putting something in your books because you thought it might be useful to the enemy? Uh, you know, this, this is going to be a kind of a strange uh, answer. Uh, 
in Transfer of Power, after I finished it, I gave the manuscript to some Secret Service agents who had helped me. And they said, you know, <laughs> if you publish this, we're going to lose our jobs. They'll figure out we've been talking to you. So uh, could you help us out? So I went back in and I changed a bunch of stuff in the White House. And I put a disclaimer at the front of the book. Um, so that was the first time I, and, I, I, and the disclaimer was out of, uh, Respect for the security of the, uh, of the uh, out of respect for the United States Secret Service and the security of the President of the United States, I've changed certain things in this book. Now, I'm not as concerned about tipping off the terrorists. Back in the day, I, I didn't think they were reading them. Now they might. I'll grant you that. Um, but um, the bigger issue is, if they're thinking of it, we need to be thinking about it. And so what these books have done is they've opened a lot of people's eyes in Washington, and I am in no way uh, disparaging their ability to do this. I, I, for years, I used to get worked up about authors and screenwriters who would fly to New York and say, we're going to help you guys game plan the next attack. And I'd be like, oh, God. Um, but then one day, it really did occur to me, these men and women are in and out of meetings all day long, scrambling. They don't have the luxury to lock themselves away at a cabin for three months a year and really delve into the mind of the terrorist and use that you know, innate creativity, that God-given talent. So um, I, I like the fact that these books, those people read them, they pick up the phone. Trust me, I've had uh, Joe Hagan, uh, uh, President Bush's uh, deputy uh, White House chief of staff, I uh, took a tour with him in the White House one day, and he said, um, a couple of weeks after 9-11, I walked into the uh, Situation Room and I threw a copy of Transfer Power down in the middle of the table with all my department heads and I said, I just read this book over the weekend. Everybody needs to read this thing. This is, we got to come up with a plan. Because at that point, they didn't have evacuation plans set up. If it's a plane that hits the building, is it a biological attack? If so, you better stay in the building. You're not, you better not run outside. So um, I like the fact that these books get them thinking outside the box. Th the one thing I have done I stumbled across something uh, four years ago that was potentially extremely explosive, not to the enemy, but to certain politicians in Washington and the ACLU. And if, they, if I had put this in the book, I would have exposed a very successful program, and I didn't put it in the book because I didn't want to... Um, I didn't want to jeopardize our men and women, not that they would have been shot or hurt, but I didn't want to blow this operation, and I don't want to see these people put up on trial or brought up on charges. So I didn't put it in the book. There's a question right here. Yes. Yeah, Vince, I have a comment and then a, a two-part question. First, the comment, as I mentioned, the book signing, uh, you have big fans on Tuesday morning docents. We have a book club, and we're in books between six and nine, between somewhere between consent to kill and protect and defend. So, uh, big Unfortunately, fans. I'm not available Tuesday. next Tuesday. <laughs> but. but when you are, come on down. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> my two-part question first, uh, is there a Vince Flynn, or is, excuse me, is there a Mitch Rapp out there? And the second part is, on the flip of that, will there be a turn limits too? Ooh. Um, uh, uh, there will not be a term limits too. Uh, there, I, I, I could have only started that book when I was 27. If I tried to write that book right, I, I'm, I'm, I was fearless back then. Now I have you know, a wife and children. And uh, if that book was published today, uh, I would be shredded. I mean, absolutely shredded. And um, I wrote it as a cautionary tale. I wrote it out of frustration over a friend who had been murdered in Washington, DC. And there's a lot of emotion in that book. But let's just say that I hope it never comes to that. I, I would like the politicians in Washington to wake up and, and uh, not bankrupt this country so that our grandchildren can live here. Um, there, there are real life Mitch Raps. Um, and they, they have to lead a very secret life. Um, they do live in fear of prosecution. They, I don't know if anyone's been following the news, uh, you know, going back for a while, the controversy over the rules of engagement in Afghanistan right now. This is the stuff that, that drives these men and women insane, that they have to deal with all of, they have to fight with both arms tied behind their back. And so um, 
I always get nervous about this question because I'm afraid if I answer it too truthfully, I will uh, bring some unwanted attention to certain things. But they are, by and large, and I cover this in the book, um, they're, almost all of them are former special forces or special operators. Um, and they, they, they serve their time on Delta Force or the SEAL teams or uh, recon marines or rangers, and then they go in and they, they do this stuff, and they're, they're pretty amazing. And as I had a conversation in Washington a few years ago with somebody, the, one of the best parts about them is they know how to keep their mouths shut. Um, they will never turn on each other. And uh, they don't like politicians, they don't like lawyers, and uh, <laughs> you know, that's just the way they are. And, and again, I, I explore that, that, that's the other thing, and uh, the big question that I asked an American assassin is, who knowingly wants to go kill for their country? Who decides at the age of 22, you know what, I wanna go kill those bad guys? And a lot of them fit a very similar profile. They're quiet guys, they're not cocky, they're not out there shooting, you know, screaming in your face, let's kill these guys, let's mess them up last night. They're cool customers. They are the NFL. I mean, th these are the true superstars. If you look at any, uh, any job in this world and you look at the people that get to the very top, in, in football, it's the NFL, and in the military, the world over, those elite warriors on the SEAL teams and Delta Force and the Rangers and, again, Marine Recon, they are at the absolute pinnacle of their craft. And it kills me that we don't pay them more. The big story on the news today was that, you know, we got these, some woman who works for the New Jersey, she, she takes the tolls in New Jersey, we made like $323,000 last year. And these guys are getting paid 40 grand a year, no overtime. And they're putting their life on the line. So, you know, there's a lot of them out there and they're, they're fighting the fight. We have time for one last question, it's right here. Two-parter, if I may. Has there been any discussion between you and your friend Daniel Silver on a collaborative novel? And part two, can you give us any news on the movie? That's sure. development? Uh, Daniel and I jokingly talk about a collaborative novel. Interestingly enough, I am collaborating with Brian Haig, which is, I can't believe I didn't announce this sooner. <laughs> Brian Haig is the son of Alexander Haig, who worked for President Reagan. And um, that series is going to come out in the spring. It's about an NYPD counterterrorism detective. We're working on it right now. Brian, I think, is one of the most talented writers in America today. If you are looking for somebody to read, he is fantastic, Brian Haig. The movie update. We're actually, I'm gonna make the announcement here at the Reagan Library. No, don't get that excited. It's a, <laughs> we're putting a button up on the website. Help us cast Mitch Rapp. Um, this has been going on forever. For years, Hollywood would not touch this project for reasons that I don't have enough time to get into tonight, but I think there's a natural bias in that town. Um, <laughs> It's a slight one. Um, but Les Moonves, very smart guy, runs CBS Corp, Corp which uh, Simon & Schuster is part of. Uh, a couple years ago, he started up a new division called uh, CBS Films, Motion Picture Studio. Um, and one of the first things Les did was acquire the rights to the Mitch Rapp franchise because he knew how well it was doing in the publishing world. Um, PW last year listed their top, you know, they do it every year, they list their top 300 writers or whatever it is. And uh, we came in in the top 10. It's the only, and by the way, I'm the only author in that top 10 that hasn't had a movie made or isn't having a movie made right now. And um, it's, it's gonna happen. CBS Films, we've got the five revisions on the screenplay. Jonathan, Jonathan Lemkin wrote a great screenplay. Jonathan uh, wrote the screenplay for The Shooter. We've signed up Antoine Fuqua from Training Day and The Shooter to, to, to direct. Uh, we are in the final negotiations right now. I shouldn't say negotiations. We're about to do the, a big casting call. And the names that are being bantered around are um, Gerard Butler, who I think is fantastic. I think all these guys are fantastic, by the way. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, um, uh, Eric Bana, uh, I'm going to forget a bunch of them and I'm going to get in trouble. Um, there's about eight names on the list right now. And they're really going to start pushing hard in the next couple of weeks. Another name that's very exciting that's on the list is Bruce Willis. He's a little old for the part. Uh, but 
he's one of my favorite actors. I just think the guy's amazing, and I actually think he could pull it off. So it's, it's a very interesting time, and I hope, I keep saying this, I hope you know, in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to make the announcement. So again, because this could be kind of fun, uh, a little market research, go to my website, click on uh, Cast Mitch Rap, because I keep telling Hollywood, they throw these ideas at me, and I'll, they'll throw out a name, and I, won't, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, because uh, this is on the internet, I think, but somebody will throw out a name, let's say someone from the left side of the aisle in LA, uh, and shows up with a lot of protests. And they'll say, how about Sean Penn? And people go, what? <laughs> you know, they scream, are you crazy? You know, um, you know, and some other names like that. So it would be a huge, for me, it would be a huge help. And I think they would actually like the research to find out who people think should play Mitch Rapp on the big screen. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Right. Thank you very Thank much. You Appreciate it. Coming.